Hello everyone, welcome back to Till the Night Comes, When the Night Comes. That's the name, I can never remember. This is now the point where we need to go to a lunar festival and who we gonna bring? We gonna bring the demon, that's who we're gonna bring. The demon to the lunar festival, even though he's a demon and people probably don't like him and he's also kind of very, you know, skittish and he's very curious about things. Let's write stuff down and I wanna see what's in that book. What did he write about me? I bet he wrote that, I was cute. Anywho, I step up into the stoop and knock once before entering. The shop is warm, a nice reprieve from the biting winter outside. I spot a pointed tail swaying behind the shop counter, and as the bell above the door jingles, Omen pops up. De dog Hello, Omen. What are you up to down there? I was just looking for my notes. I thought I'd lost them, but apparently I'm just excellent at hiding stuff. I had to wait for Finn and Ezra to leave to get a proper look around here. I'm not supposed to go near the counter. Is it because you like to eat things? Why not? He drops his gaze, his tail wrapping around his leg, ears drooping. I may or may not have accidentally set fire to it once. Maybe? Omen. No, bad. Bad omen. I move to where he stands, and sure enough, the wood at the base is charred, blackened. Does that happen a lot? He shakes his head, looking a little sad, maybe even guilty. Not really, but it does catch me off guard here and there. I try to control it, but sometimes my emotions get the better of me. But were you looking for Ezra? You just missed him. No, I was looking for you, actually. His eyes grow wide, brow raised. His tail unfurls from behind his leg, or from around his leg, gently swaying from side to side. Me? Why? I'd like to take you to the festival. I would love to take you to the festival if you'd like that. You would? I laugh, charmed by his obvious shock. Of course, don't you think it would be fun? I think most things with you would be fun. Okay. Score one for Omen being able to flirt. We're going to just chalk that up in the... Good for him. Can we catch the fireworks together? Can we watch the fireworks together? Not catch the fireworks together. That would be a little bit more dangerous. <laughs> oh, and get some hot chocolate. He looks at me as if he's testing the waters, waiting to see if Ezra has informed me that he's banned from indulging in the sweeter thing. Maybe we'll just stick to the fireworks. He already told you, didn't he? Well, it was worth a shot. Why can't he have sweet things, though? Does he become evil if that's the case? He grabs his notebook, tucking it into the safety of his fluffy coat. Let's go. To the festival with my demon friend. Omen skips along beside me, tipping his head skyward to catch snowflakes on the tip of his tongue. A tongue which I'm starting to discover is alarmingly long and as black as the night. I try not to stare, but it is, it's is—it's hard not to stare at that very hard. Omen, do you mind me asking what kind of demon you are? He stops dead in his track, looking at me to check where that we're alone as we continue down the icy, cobbled street. Oh, uh, I'm not supposed to tell. Doesn't matter if you're not supposed to tell, I ask you. Well, that's not suspicious at all. Does Ezra know? He nods, wrapping his arms around himself. Yes, but I didn't tell him. He just knew. No one else does, though, and I'd love to tell you, but... It's fine, I understand, and I'm sure you'll tell me eventually. He smiles, twirling around once, twice, tipping his head back for more. He's clearly enamored with the snow, wiggling his fingers, palm facing upward as he ch uh, catches flakes against his pale skin. They melt upon contact faster than they would if I were to do the same. He looks a little sad, a, a heavy sigh falling from his lips. What's the matter? He stops turning to face me. Sometimes it sucks being as warm as I am. I love the snow. We don't have it where I come from. But you I just come from hell? Sleep the same as everyone else. <laughs> Is that where you come from? Oh, let's make snow angels together. Let's be cute. I know something fun we could do that you'd be quite good at, actually. Technically, that's true. It's snow angels. Also, that's ironic because he's a demon, so. I nod, reaching out, he takes my hand, and I feel just how warm he is. It's not uncomfortable. Definitely a shock at first, though. Sorry, I know it's weird, we don't have to... It's fine, it's nice, shut up, you demon. It is. I squeeze his hand to reassure him, his warmth sinking right down to my bones. I'm freezing, and you're warming me up. He smiles, it's soft and unmistakably sweet. I'm glad. I clear my throat, trying not to get too distracted by the way he's looking at me with that charming gaze. Now, we just need to lay in the snow. Lay down in the snow? But it'll just melt underneath me. That's the point. 
I drag him toward an undisturbed patch of snow that sits between two houses, falling to my knees and urging him to follow. Sure enough, the snow quickly melts beneath him. Well, that's kind of the point here. Just copy me, okay? He nods quickly, following my lead as I lay back, still clasping his hands as I splay out my arms and legs. He starts to laugh at me and my flapping, but when he realizes what I'm doing, he enthusiastically joins in. I help him stand when we're done. His snow angel is far more impressive than mine. See? You can have fun in the snow. You're an angel now. He leans against me, laughter still shaking his shoulders. Hey, since you're a demon, does that mean angels actually exist? That's definitely the first time I've ever been called an angel. We reached the market a little while later, having become quite distracted with Omen's fascination with the snow. He's in an amazing mood, bright and cheerful, and I feel my worries melting away while I'm in his presence. He insists that we seek out of the that we seek out the area of the market where they sell food and drinks, and I keep my wits about me and heed Ezra's warning. No chocolate. Can't feed demons chocolate. They turn into demons. You're serious. I stand my ground, even when he looks at me with those big brown eyes. Ezra said no, and I trust he's looking out for you. Do you want to tell me why you can't have chocolate? I might be a little allergic to it. Okay. So you want to eat it, and then you want to... Die, but you Can you die? Demons can die, right? I mean, vampire everyone can die, technically. Demons can have allergies? Apparently, yeah. Then definitely not. Don't want you getting sick. He huffs, sliding up to me, his tail swaying lazily behind him. All that happened is my tongue gets a little weird, tingly even. I clear my throat, nodding. Oh, okay, okay. tingly tongue, got it. A heavy, stubborn sigh, and I wonder if I'm about to see a demon-tempered cantrum. Uh, he doesn't supply any further information, instead offers me a shy smile. T tingly? He nods, his, curl, his t uh, tail curling around my wrist, giving it an ins insistent tug. Please? Just a little? Uh, fine. Only because you're cute. I find it quite hard to deny him when he's looking at me like that. I sigh, defeated, and before I've even said yes, he's excitedly clapping. Fine. Just a tiny taste. Nothing too crazy. And it's going to be dark chocolate, but the tiny bit one. That way it's extra tingly. Deal. Deal. You pick something and we'll share. I return with the box of chocolate truffles, lovingly wrapped in gold tissue paper and tied with the big red bow. This reminded me of you, the colors, because you know, the red. And also the gold. Technically, he has gold on him too. Yeah, they're my favorite. Now it's chocolate time. I roll my eyes, unable to stop myself from smiling as I open the box, letting him pick one. He delicately brings it to his lips, taking a careful bite. He hums contently as he chews, and I take the other half of the truffle from him before he gets a chance to swallow it whole. It tastes amazing. Yes, well, it's always the things we like the most that we can't have. He sticks his hand in his mouth, and I quickly draw a, a, and he sticks his hand in his mouth, and I quickly crowd closer, prying it away. Are you okay? He clears his throat, lashing uh, lashes fluttering as he looks at me. I'm fine, it's just a little tingle. It's annoying, sure, but it's also quite nice. Oh. I clear my throat, trying to snap myself from his little daze I've suddenly fallen into, one where I'm apparently fixated on a demon's tongue. It, okay. Um, as long as you're okay. Park the fireworks gonna start soon. Yeah, let's let's do that. Let's let's get we're I'm sorry, sir, you're you make me a bit bit uncomfortable with your tongue and everything. Um, Omen shrugs, looking up, uh, shrugs, looking up at the sky. I lost track of time. I'm having too much fun with you. I smile back, warmth blooming in my chest. We should make our way there, just to be sure. The docks are packed, teeming with people. We squeeze as close as we can, but Omen stays close, apparently not a huge fan of such a big crowd. The sky suddenly comes alive with loud, bright bursts of ever-changing colors. I tear my graves from the fireworks, looking at Omen. He's transfixed, staring at the sky with such naked wonder that my chest aches. Wow, they're so beautiful. He meets my gaze, blushing when he sees that I'm already looking at him. Oh, I got caught. Do you see, D-Dog? I nod slowly, a smile creeping upon my lips. I see. Even louder, even over the loud boom of fireworks, I can hear his breath hitch. 
and unless I'm seeing things, a low, deep orange glow thrumming right where his heart lies. He places his head upon... He places his hand upon his chest, fingers curling in the fabric of his jacket, an impossible warmth radiating off of him. The colors that burst in the sky reflect upon his pale skin, and I see just how dark his eyes have turned, almost black. He closes them, long lashes arresting atop pink cheeks. The display comes to an end, the crowd cheering, clapping. I lean in, then, somewhere in the distance, I hear an awful, bone-chilling scream. And you... That's cute, but oh no. I need to new. Warning, uh-oh. Any dialogue options labeled fight in this chapter will lead to scenes containing violence and gore. Player discretion is advised. Well, that's exciting. Uh-oh. The cold winter wind whips against my skin and I run as fast as I can, sinking deeper into the ominous woodland, woodland that surrounds the Nars. I'm hot on Piper's heels, and she's determined hyper-focused, as am I. There's nothing like the hunt, the way my instincts drive every feeling, my senses sharpen to a nice edge, my every thought is fixated on winning and only winning. I can think of nothing else but finding the source of the distress, a terrible sense of dread swirling deep in my gut. The woods are teeming with every hunter and enforcer Linares has to offer, each and every one of us silently hoping that this isn't what we think it is, that this isn't the fifth victim that we've all been expecting, another of our comrades targeted and slain so brutally and without an apparent motive, killed simply for doing their jobs, protecting humankind. My feet pound the frost crisp grass. Tall trees with gnarled branches that curl inward like talons, almost naked from winter's grass, looming high above us. I spot eyes glowing in the darkness, but I quickly realize they're carved messes messily into the rickety tree trunks. They glow ominously, and as another gust of wind blows, I swear I see them blink. I make a mental note to remind myself to return to investigate, though I'm sure there's nothing new not in a town like this. Piper skids to a stop, her fingers diligently hovering just above the handle of each of her daggers that sit safely in the holster in her back. Do you hear that? A quiet but obvious whisper echoes amongst the trees, a pained groan from something unquestionably inhuman from a creature. I did. Her fingers twitch, so do mine. Eyes narrowed every sense of razor sharpened, zoned in on that singular point. It feels point. young and inexperienced. It's beneath our skill level. Beneath us. She says it with such confidence, and her guard is still firmly up. The duo of wide-eyed hunter sergeants that have been ordered to tail us arrive at our side, their cheeks rosy from the harsh bite of the wind. Major. Piper opens her mouth to respond, but she pauses, looking at me. You're the highest rank here, General. Do we move on and let these two handle it? Or do you fancy working out some tension? Uh, it. I think it's time to fight, don't you? Let's fight. I could always do with working out a little tension. That's what I was hoping you'd say. I haven't had a good fight in what feels like forever. Yeah, we need an action scene. Let's fight, bruh. I turn to address the sergeants. Continue heading for the rendezvous point. If you encounter General Willenheim, tell him that we're on our way. They nod a little too eagerly and run downward. The hairs on the back of my neck rise the second they're out of sight. My body is gearing up for a fight, adrenaline co coursing generously through my veins. Adrenaline. <laughs> Sorry, the Cody Rhodes theme song popped in my head. Adrenaline in my soul. Uh, something, something Cody Rhodes. Uh, I close my eyes and clear my mind. I can hear a steady, assured thrum of Piper's heartbeat, the quiet rustle of the grass, the leaves rustling in the trees. Then, I feel it. A vampire, a youngling. Her aura is frantic and skittish. She's only just awoken. She's hungry and scared. She's trying to hide. A smile. I smile. We're out quite far. I used to find younglings in this I used, always used to find younglings in this area. She can likely sense that there's a clan here. She's either seeking guidance or an easy meal. It's too dangerous to let her live. She's unstable. Then we kill her. The youngling finally emerges from the tree line, her vivid crimson ir irises surrounded by a blackened scleria. 
Her eyes flicker widely as she lumbers towards us, unfocused and impossibly unsteady on her feet. This should be easy. She's clearly deprived of blood, dark vining veins surrounding her wild eyes and creep down to her pale cheeks. She wears no shoes, her feet black with mud, and her clothing is torn and saturated with blood, most of it likely her own. Her death was obviously not a merciful one. She's quite clearly been left to navigate her rebirth by herself, and this never ends well, ends in a slaughter of innocent lives. Her lips curl menacingly to reveal sharp fangs that she's clearly still getting used to, and she lunges at us without hesitation. Counterattack! Before she even gets the chance, I propel myself forward, lunging and knocking her off balance. I watch her stagger, her newly fa broken fangs barred as she scrambles on shaky legs to steady herself. I circle her, a hunter and its prey, because that's exactly what we are. She doesn't stand a fucking chance. Piper shifts somewhere behind me, and considering we've never hunted together before, our instincts are perfectly aligned. She moves, I move, it moves, we attack. She tries to attack again, shrieking as she attempts to fling herself forward and attach herself to my Not neck. today, sweetheart. I grab her arms, twisting her and holding her tightly as Piper sinks one of her, dagger, her daggers into her shoulder. The youngling screeches, a deafening sound that leaves my eardrums crackling. She thrashes as the silver burns her flesh, the smell of it turning my stomach. She tries to claw at the blade, leaving her fingers bloodied even more so than they already were. I tackle her to the forest floor, pushing her face into the dirt, my knee firmly lodged against her spine. The youngling screams as Piper forcefully grabs her hair, yanking her head back. She stares her down, tactfully avoiding the snapping of her jaw, and she shakes her head. Put her out of her misery. We work in tandem to remove her, uh, her head clean from her body. It's the only way, however violent it may be. I feel warmth spray against my skin, the unmistakable smell of copper permeating the air. The visceral sound of tearing flesh and breaking bone fill the clearing. Then she turns the nothingness beneath us, an unrecognizable pile of blood and viscera, yet another human life stolen and twisted into something evil. Well, that was fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, I need a drink after all of that. That was a lot of reading. <sighs> I brush the dirt from my knees and take a deep breath while I, uh, watching Piper clean off her bloody daggers on the grass. We should really get going. She turns to face me and I spot her face covered in a dark sputtering of crimson. Uh, you've got red on you. I point my own cheek, tapping it gently. She looks at me like I'm an absolute idiot. You've got blood on your face. Ah, oh, well that's new. You do too. Are you stealing my look? I shrug, scrubbing my own skin in my on my sleeve of my coat just to be sure it comes away a deep crimson i call it hunter chic piper rolls her eyes uh, sheathing her daggers and swiping at her face she huffs as the slowly drying blood smears across her russet skin piss gone i study her carefully nodding my approval clean as a whistle or at least as clean as someone who hasn't just slain a feral murder murderous vampire Bad at jokes, why am I not surprised? She takes a deep breath, looking around my now eerily quiet clearing. We'd better get going. August will be having an absolute bitch fit. Why, we just killed a thing. Feel like he would be saying good job. Piper tilts her head aside, a loud crack as her bones click back into her rightful position. Something like that. Let's dash. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the microphone picked that up or not. It's easy to tell what we're dealing with as we draw nearer to the scene. Dozens of hunters and forces of varying ranks and saturate the, small clear saturate the small clearing. The majority of them still dressed in their festival attire, much like Piper and I. We spot a retrieval team emerging from the tree line. Their faces are pale and drawn. It's then that I know. They didn't make it. Yeah, you're here. We are. We ran into some trouble on the way, but we took care of it. I gather that's why you were so late. It's fine. Obviously, such things cannot be prevented. Not good news, as I'm sure you can tell. Somebody else died. My heart sinks. I knew, but hearing it out loud, still unpleasant. Do we have an identity? They shake their head, brushing the front of their fur coat that I'm sure they are less than happy that they're wearing in such a situation. We cannot identify them. Their voice catches. There is no body. Again, nothing but... Uh... Well, I don't need to repeat such monstrous details. You've read the reports from the previous murders. Much of the same ghastliness. Basically burned and 
turned into ash. Piper scoffs, her shoulders tensing, and I swear I can see tears in her eyes. She's hurting and angry. So angry that I can feel it. Goose flesh prickles upon, like goosebumps, prickles across my skin thanks to our close pr uh, proximity, and my own emotions waver with the sheer force of it. This is fucking ridiculous. This cannot keep happening, August. Ooh. I flinch, feeling the, uh, the surge of energy as August reacts. The smell of ozone is suddenly thick in the air. There's a flash in the darkness, and violent sparks crackle about their clenched fist, their eyes alight. Thank you, Piper, for your input. I didn't know this was upsetting. I assumed everyone was enjoying this. A dozen eyes turn to look at them, and they quickly calm themselves. August looks beyond exhausted, as always. The skin beneath their eyes is purple, their cheeks drawn. Piper opens her mouth to retaliate, but wisely decides against it. This actually might be the first time I've seen her look guilty. August averts their gaze as they can't bear to look at her. They're upset, too. I suggest you keep your thoughts to yourself in such a situation. Unless you have any useful insight. It's not a question. Yes. Sorry, General. I thought as much. We're all hurting, Piper, not just you. August sighs deeply, sparing us both a woeful glance before they address the gathered forces. Hunters, any mages present will patrol the immediate area. Generals will head further afield and begin an extensive perimeter search. I want no stone unturned here. Any juniors need to get the hell out of here. You're not <laughs> equipped to even think about dealing with whatever this thing is. And I won't be responsible for your demise. Anyone else present is to report back to headquarters immediately. We'll need people on the ground in order to reassure the townsfolk. I don't want this causing widespread panic. It's damage control time. There's a quiet, subdued mumble of yes, General, and they all dutifully begin to obey August's orders, disappearing in various directions. Would you like me to join the perimeter search? No, I'd like you to go home. Leave this to the others. We need you ready for anything that may transpire overnight. Oh, of course. Piper fidgets uneasy. Well, you're a major, aren't you? If you're listening, you'll know what I asked of you. The tension between them is yet again immensely unpleasant. Of course, General. She should have expected such a response, and I wonder if she'll ever learn, or maybe she's hoping to rile them up. I can't really tell. She throws me a quick, pitiful, a quick, pitiful glance before she glares at August and turns to join her comrades. Later. August massages their temples, inhaling sharply. I notice that their hands are trembling, and I unconscious unconsciously take a step towards them, fearful they might pass out. They hold out their hand. I'm fine, really. General. I appreciate your concern, Hunter, really. Anything that ails me is my fault and mine alone. Now please head back. I meant it when I said you needed rest. You'll be the first to hear if anything significant happens. I'll send a messenger to retrieve you when the victim has been identified. Of course. Good night. Stay safe. If you think I'm staying out here in this for another second, you're sorely mistaken. I have a mountain of paperwork the size of the A back on my desk. Farewell, dear. I take a final look at the scene where the Enforcer Witches uh, have cast their mage lights over a bloody patch of grass, leaving them to their work no matter how much I long to investigate. After that outburst, it's best not to question my Enforcer's request. I bow my head before I turn, eager to get out of here. As I head back through the woodland, I notice how eerily silent it is. A strange sense of calm washes over me. Then, a whisper. Mary. I stop dead in my tracks, my hand hovering over my weapon. I see nothing, feel nothing, no matter how hard I concentrate. Then I realize that voice, that familiar yet subdued ache that begins to creep in my temple. James? You deserve to know. The pain ebbs and flows, my breathing grows unsteadily, almost as if something weighs heavy upon my chest. The fleeting, comforting calm that had just settled over me is snatched away as his voice continues to echo in my mind know what i'm so a sharp burning pain shoots up along my spine and i fall to the ground the snow-covered grass is wet beneath my fingertips his words were cut off and after a moment i'm yet again surrounded by a blissful silence fucking ghost i drag myself to my feet and now i have only one thing on my mind one thing that i must do visit the lieutenant general and find out what the hell is happening to me After having having no luck finding him in his own office, I head to the only other place I assume he may be at this hour. The door to August's office is thankfully ajar, so I peek around the thing, finding Harry standing alone. 
He had a report in hand. His coat hung on the back of August's chair. His uh, He looks exhausted, his eyes red-rimmed. However, when he noticed me, he still offers a bright, earnest smile. I can't tell you how relieved I am to see you safe. My throat feels tight, and I can't p quite place why. James is doing a good job of making it difficult for me to stop thinking about him. The pain I felt from his final moment was raw, like it's like an exposed nerve. For some reason, when I think of it, I now think of Harry. I need to know why he wanted me to come here, why everything seems to point me back to the man standing before me. I need to tell you something, but I need to promise you won't think I've lost my mind. Harry narrows his gaze, nodding once. Go on. I visited the graveyard a few days ago while I was getting my bearings. He stays silent, but I can't help but notice the way his knuckles bleed white as he tightens his fist. I felt an overwhelming sense of grief there, pain, a yearning for a lost love, a sense of failure and crippling sorrow. I thought nothing of it at the time. It's not unheard of for those that have been murdered to feel scared or sentimental in their final moments, in my experience. But Harry drops his gaze, a gaze his bright eyes and edged with tears. My words threaten to catch in his throat, but I can't relent. The other night, I visited again. It was almost like something was pulling me there. I heard more, not just a memory this time, he spoke to me. He looks like he's seen a ghost. He stares, his wa stares at me wide-eyed, quickly swiping at his cheeks. Oh, James. Oh, so he knows. I get the horrible feeling that he's been waiting for this. I need to know. He nods, clearly understanding. Then he takes a deep, shuddering breath. James was assigned as my very first hunter the moment we both graduated at 18. He'd shown remarkable promise in school, basically skipping all of the junior nonsense that they force on you. I, too, had impressed, so we were placed together in the hopes that we'd become unstoppable. We were inseparable in the field together for decades, until I took this post as Lieutenant General. I pause, uh, sorry, a pause and another deep breath, one that shakes. But, as well as being my subordinate, he was also my partner. <gasps> they were dating, and he died, oh no! My husband. Oh, they weren't dating, they were married, that's even worse. My heart sinks, bile rising in my throat. I've read countless reports about him in the infamous Hunter Lane over the years, but I never knew his first name or anything about him other than the incom incomparable work, incomparable work. Official records tend to omit personal details for the safety of the hunter or enforcer in question unless they become a leader like Harry. They were in inimitable, the best of the best. Together, they killed some of the most nefarious creatures in our history, and without question, every young trainee aspires to be like the Hunter Lane. Do you think they're just gone and what Harry must be going through? So sorry, I had no idea. For nearly ten years, yes. But we'd known each other forever. I failed the Hunter initiation quite dramatically, and he was taken away to his father's home country to train to become... What I'd always dreamed of becoming. Life had other plans for me, but we still found each other in the end. He used to joke that we were destined. The romantic fool. I really don't think it's sunk in that he's gone just yet. Still doesn't explain why I know. I keep like thinking why I can he's hear him. going to walk through my door, covered head to toe in blood and grime, with a stupid, wonderful grin on his face. I notice how his eyes light up when he talks about it. They say that people deal with grief differently. But I haven't quite figured mine out just yet. I apologize for not telling you, but it was important to me that I could trust you first. My judgment has been impaired, I'll admit it. Though this turn of events isn't exactly what I expected. Still don't know why I can hear Ghost. All I can think about now is justice. About the others that died before him, and what we could have done to stop it. What I could have done to stop it. What did he tell you when he spoke to you? His words waver, and his mindlessly f and he mindlessly fiddles with his wedding man, eagerly waiting his response. I think about what Ezra said about being careful who I share this with. Did that warning apply to the Lieutenant General of all of Escria? Oh no! Do I tell him the truth or lie to him? He has no reason. To be a bad guy, right? Like, he has no reason to be the one behind this. Although, we do need, like, a bad guy in this, right? We have to solve the murder. Plus, that it obviously he knows now that I knew that I can hear him. Huh, I'm gonna tell him the truth. Be a good boy. We're good. He told me to leave, and that he failed, and that there's no hope. 
He swallows thickly, his expression unchanging. I got the impression he wanted to say more, but I don't know how he managed to communicate me with me in the first place. Yes, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I think he can only say so much before he fades away. It feels like a great struggle for him to reach out. I cannot explain it. I can't explain it. He closes his eyes tight, shaking his head as if he can't bear to hear any more. I will need you to speak to Augustus about this. They know more about psionic magic than anyone here. I'm sure they'll be able to help you figure this out. I do not trust anyone else. Right, like, exactly. So, like, Harry's on our side, and also Harry's friends with Augustus, and, like, if unless, uh, unless Augustus is the bad guy, which I don't think there is, that he is, then a hopeful look. Did... Did he truly not say anything else? He didn't, but the first night I felt him, I could tell how much he loved you, Harry. You were all he could think about in his final moments. He laughs quietly. <laughs> yes. Well, he's all I can think about, too. A curse now, I suppose. Silence hangs heavy between us, and I don't quite know what to say next. He looks devastated, understandably. He must have so much on his mind already with the latest murder, and now this. The way he came alive when he spoke about James didn't go unnoticed, and I wonder if he maybe talking about him would lift his mood. There's a lot of hunters out there that can only aspire to be half as brilliant as the hunter Lane. I would love to hear what he was like if you don't mind. His somber expression disappears and he seems to brighten up a little. He was a cocky son of a bitch, but it worked well for him in the field. He was never careless though. I often found myself watching him instead of paying attention to whatever was attacking us. Luckily, he could fight well enough to protect us both, or I'm sure we'd have been in trouble. A lot of enforcers choose to stay cooped up in a stuffy office, away from all that danger. Working with James made me not want to miss a thing. He digs into his coat pocket, retrieving his wallet and pulling out a small, weathered photo. He pauses, staring me down as he has reservations, but then he hands it over. Show me that photo. Oh man, look how cute they look. That's cute. It's of him and James. They look young, beyond happy, and possibly in love. That's very cute. <laughs> we were unbearable to be around, I'm sure. I study the genuine smiles and the rye of their fingers are laced together. I may not know James aside from the voice in my head, but I feel a strange connection to him as if I've also known him forever. Thank you for showing me. He ducks the photo back into the uh, place right beside a neatly folded up letter. Well... Apparently, he appears to have taken a liking to you. It's only fair for you to put a face to the name, I suppose. He stares down at his hand, once again twisting his wedding band. His expression is neutral when he meets my gaze, but in split decision, his disposition shifts to the stiff formality I'm so used to when dealing with figures of authority. I gather that our conversation about his dearly departed is over. What happened tonight could have been prevented. It's unacceptable that we were so aware of the looming threat, and yet we let our guard down and lost another life. This cannot happen again. To be fair, we did try to say this was a bad idea. I'm not agreeing wholeheartedly, but I cannot shake the feeling that yes, this could have been prevented if it weren't for the festival. The festival, he was so adamant, went ahead despite others' clear apprehension, including August. See, that's the, that's the thing. He wanted that festival to happen, but also everyone was against that festival happening. This is a double-bladed a double-bladed sword? Um two-edged thing because like it was a good thing to have that festival because you wanted like the people of the town to like you know feel better you can't have everyone on edge because then bad things happen that way too i think better of pressing the matter harry suddenly doesn't seem like a man willing to admit fault did you speak to the twins as i requested yeah one of them was creepy and the other one was less i did but as sure as you expected i didn't get much out of them quiet hum, which I think is an indifferent agreement, and Harry, uh, Harry sighs heavily. They are rather adept at both lying and sheer avoidance. I am interested in speaking to the brother alone, though. There was something off about him, like he didn't want to be there. I also came across a letter outside the building, one that was addressed to him. The language looked demonic. I am friends with a demon. Maybe they can translate. Harry nods, indifferent, and I wonder if he even heard me. He clears his throat and flicks his eyes to the side as though he has no interest in humoring me any longer. There's nothing more you can do here until we've identified the victim. Get some rest. It's late. You're dismissed, Hunter. Though I'm used to being addressed in such a manner, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't perplexed by the shift in his demeanor. 
I chalk it down to grief, just as he said, but I can't help but feel like maybe I've disappointed him somehow. I turn and quietly leave. Snow is falling as I step through outside. Uh, though the hour is late, there's certainly no peaceful quiet Linares tonight. The streets outside of headquarters are bustling with hunters, enforcers, and everything in between. I keep my head down as I make my way towards the wolf. I fall into a trance as I replay my conversation with Harry over and over, trying to pinpoint the exact moment that made him change his attitude so drastically. Also, I just realized I live in the wolf, and I didn't pay attention to that. Like, it's probably like an upstairs thing. I, I'm snapped back to reality, whoop, there's go gravity, when I bump into something cold and hard, finding a pair of familiar golden eyes staring back at me when I look up. Finn? <gasps> Hello? Distracted, are we? I was a bit busy looking at things. I step back, brushing down the front of my coat. I can see his lips are on the cusp of curling to the side in a vaguely amused smirk. You could say that it's been a long night. He offers me a sympathetic look, shoving his hands firmly into his coat pockets as a duo of enforcers passes by. They make a point to glare at him, and by proxy at me for being near him. Finn dutifully avoids their gazes like a man who had centuries of perfect feigning indifference to the way people like me treat him and his kind. I'm glad to see you safety, dog. We were all worried about you when we heard. Thank you, Finn. He turns to check that the street is clear, turning back to me with a serious look. I have my clan patrolling the woods. I'll ensure that we're out until dawn, searching if necessary, anything we can do to help whatever or whoever is doing this. I'm grateful for the assistance, and I certainly can't say I've ever had an entire clan of vampires as allies before. I'm optimistic that their help will be of great value to me. However, didn't we just kill a newly formed vampire, which means the person that attacked them was a vampire? Is it a rival clan of this person, or is it someone that's in their clan? We have to think about all these different scenarios they could be. That's very kind. After an indecipherable pause, Finn's expression drifts somewhere far away. You know, I was out just there just now. I picked up a scent, something familiar. Familiar how? He steps closer, and there's a certain air of caution in the way he addresses me, as if he's unsure what they've truly that we're truly alone. I didn't get to hang around. There were too many enforcers, but the blood on that stone we found in the graveyard at, at the scene of... He pauses, apprehension clouding the way he looks at me. His next words are glum and as dead as his demeanor of Hunter Lane's death. He's testing the waters as if he holds the stairs. Ah, he's testing the waters if the way he holds my stairs is anything to go by, waiting to see just how clued in I am. I know about him, Finn. I spoke to Harry just now. He might be a vampire, but the look crosses his face momentarily isn't exactly subtle. He cast his eyes away from me. The frown settled at his brow, softening around his edges. He licks one of his fangs, thinking about a forlorn, li forlorn list that suits him a little too well. I see. And how did that go? I shrug because I can't really offer him anything else. I feel deflated and defeated. Not great. He's in mourning, and I don't think he's in the right mind to be making decisions. Finn purses his lips, contemplating my statement. That's a bold way to speak of your lieutenant general. But I don't doubt your instincts. I've lost loved ones, and it's never easy. The mind needs time to heal after such trauma. And all Harry is doing is delaying his grief. Eventually, he throws me a half-hearted smile, but I sense it's something pitiful rather than friendly. I suspect my frustration with my current predicament is glaringly obvious without him having to read my thoughts. I'm sorry you've been kept so in the dark. I can sense that you're frustrated, and I don't blame you. As much as I may not agree with certain information being withheld, it truly is for your safety. It's funny, because everyone keeps saying such things, but it certainly doesn't feel like anything other than sheer avoidance. He removes a hand from his pocket, running fingers through his hair with a knowing exit. Yeah, well, I cannot excuse anyone else's behavior, but I can apologize for my own. Come by the catacombs when you get the chance. I have some things we can discuss that may help. Though spending some time underground in a tomb sounds less than appealing, Finn doesn't sound like the kind of man who lives in the squalor. Plus, any information is valued, and Finn has lived here long enough to know the ins and outs of the strange little town. Thank you, I'll take you up on that as soon as I can. He tips his head, encouraging me to follow him towards the wolf, I assume. Come on, I'll walk you home. I'm eager to get inside, and with a few strides I catch up to him, falling in step. 
I don't require an escort, you know. Everyone seems so set on ensuring I'm safe, but you all seem to be forgetting I was brought here to save the day. I'm the hero. I can do the big, the, the, the fisticuffs, the boom, 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 the, 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 the old one, two, the bip and the bop, and the, the boop and the bop. Supposedly. Uh, he purses his lips in an obvious attempt to stop himself from laughing, and I watch the bob of his throat as he swallows the noise. I'm aware that you require no assistance, but think about the hunters that were killed. They were of your caliber, your rank. The best of the best, as the enforcers love to say. The thought of you ending up like them is not a pleasant one. He has a point, I suppose. Very well, but no coddling, understand? <laughs> yes, General. He laughs again when he catches the sight of the dramatic roll of my eyes, sidestepping with startling grace to avoid the elbow that I launch toward his ribcage. He walks quietly through the streets, the cobblestone glistering with frost. The moon is full and hangs low in the sky, as it always seems to it here in Lunaris, and Finn exhales sharply to break the silence. I glance at him, too, too tired to ask him any of the hundred of questions that run through my mind. I think he knows somehow, because he always seems to have something on the tip of his tongue. We stop outside the wolf, the lantern that hangs above the dark door, thanks to the late hour. I glance up at the now familiar sign. A scrappy-looking white wolf howling at the full moon, I laugh. Finn leans against the mismatched brick, stares at me quite intently, his eyes unnervingly bright in the glowing darkness. What's funny? You're all masters of being painfully cryptic, and yet I still feel at home. But I shouldn't trust a single one of you, should I? He turns, checking we are alone again before he leans in closer, his voice low. That's for you to decide. So, tell me, Hunter. What does that tricky little gut of yours tell you about all of this? About us? What do you feel? I'm about to get a thing. Uh, like it's time to go, like we should talk, or like I need a drink. Okay. You know what? We'll make this decision next time. If you ended up liking this video, click the like button. It makes me feel better. Also, if uh, you have any other games like this you'd like me to play, please comment below. I will read any comment that I ever see. If I read, I put a heart by it. And lastly, if you haven't subscribed yet, you probably should. Should I go in and put some moves on this vampire guy? I have really liked Omen, though, and I feel bad if I'm, like, talking to one and the other. Plus, Finn has the other. You know, we'll, we'll have this discussion next time. Goodbye, everybody.